I'm Dean Mitchell, and this is KPMG's Forensic Lens, detecting lies, deception and fraud in the world of business. When things go wrong in a corporation, the board directors are accountable. Directors are responsible for setting the guardrails on what is acceptable behaviour for the corporations they lead. Recent history is littered with examples of directors who lost the confidence of the community and ultimately their shareholders. So why do companies lose their way and why is the board not always effective at setting the standards that we expect? To help us take a seat at the boardroom table and listen in on what is discussed in that space, we're joined by Ming Long. Ming is a well-respected and influential leader with a long history of board experience in major corporations. Ming is currently Chair of AMP Capital Funds Management Limited, Chair of the Diversity Council of Australia and Board Director of QBE Insurance. Ming, over the course of this series, we've been talking about deception and the role individuals and corporations play in deception. But the board obviously has a role to play as well. What is the board's role in setting the tone and the expectations? The tone actually comes from us as individuals. So I'm very careful that it's not just what we say on boards, it's also how we behave on boards because everybody's watching you. You do feel like sometimes you're a goldfish in a little bowl. And sometimes it's the unsaid things and how you approach things and the mindset that actually I find trickles into the organisation. So, you know, the board has a pretty important role to be able to set that tone from the top, but then I always don't forget that there is a pretty senior executive team, CEO and their leadership team that has the biggest influence around culture and that tone from the top and how the board's tone translates to the rest of the organisation. And have you seen some examples where that's gone well and perhaps some examples where it hasn't gone so well? I mean, the quickest one that comes to mind is something that sort of happened more recently where, you know, I'm on a board where we had a potential for a conflict of interest. There was a perceived conflict of interest rather than an actual one. And it was interesting because I was bracing myself for a discussion with another colleague on the board. And one of the outcomes I wanted to discuss was the fact that we might need to resign so that there would be no perception that we had a vested interest in a decision. And, you know, you never know quite how those discussions go, but you know, what I was expecting to be like a half an hour discussion as to why, and this is really important, it took 10 minutes because he was very aligned from a values perspective to myself. And we are not motivated on this board by money. We don't need to do the job. We don't have to have the money. And when I raised the issue that, you know, this potential and it's only a perceived conflict, so it is actually quite remote, He said straight away, Ming, I think we should offer to retire slash resign. And it was such a relief because I thought, wow, you know, what could have been a much harder discussion if you are really motivated to keep the job, I need the money, took 10 minutes. And it was so easy when you had that values alignment. You know, what I've said before, if you actually want to join the board, you need to be able to retire the next day, as in you don't need the money to do that job. You don't need the profile or the job or it doesn't give you any relevance other than to ensure that you're on the board to look after the stakeholders in this organisation first over yourselves. Basically, I put directors last on the list of all the stakeholders that we should be thinking of. And that doesn't always translate into boards. So you see sometimes on boards people who, well, I say overstay their welcome, They're supposed to be non-executive directors and they've been there forever, which means that you lose your independence. And they say that they're working on succession for their role, especially if they're chair. And the chair role is especially important to set that tone for the rest of the board. And they seem to be endlessly working on succession for their role and they can't find the right person. So therefore they get extended again. And it's those sort of, I think, behaviours I sometimes see on boards and I think, you know what? That's not great for that organisation, but also for, I think, the business community because we tolerate some of these behaviours. And if anything, for leaders and especially board members, the bar is higher for us. It should be higher for us because of the governance and influence and the power we have in an organisation. Recently, a number of judicial commissions have been quite critical of boards and have said they should have done better. 
Do you think that criticism has been fair? Yes and no. You know, there's every reason to listen to like a Royal Commission and think, I don't do that and that doesn't happen on my board. But then you miss the genesis of why they're saying this is important, why it's a problem. So I listen to and take the feedback from all of those Royal Commissions or whatever it is that's been investigated through organisations and there has to be a lesson out of every single one of them and there has to be a point where we stop rationalising that we would never do those sorts of things. You know, I always think that, you know, it's very easy for us in society to blame the bad apple or oh, it's just that one evil person. There is a recognition, I think, that we all need to have that we can all, regardless of how good we think we are, can do really evil things and do bad things. And there's obviously degrees where for some people that's easier or harder. But we are all capable of doing really terrible things to other people. And it's a very fine line we tread sometimes when we're thinking about ethical dilemmas about where that line is. Where sometimes I think it's unjustified is that there has to be a recognition that directors are not full-time. There's a reason why we are non-executives. We do not spend our entire life with one organisation. I sit on a number of boards. And so there has to be recognition that it's not just the board that people point to, but there is an executive team that is also really responsible for what happens to that organisation, how it's actually behaved. And it's not just the organisation, it's actually every single individual in that organisation. It's very easy to point to, so, oh, it's that leadership team, they're just terrible. But through that whole organisation, we all had a hand in allowing things to happen that shouldn't have happened. So there has to be a level of humility by which you listen to some of those investigations. Ming, you spoke there about sometimes the boards letting things happen that perhaps they shouldn't have let happen. What do you mean by that? You know, it's interesting. The one characteristic I have found that I've needed to have on every single board I am on is courage. And it's the courage to raise the really hard things because you think, you know, what if my colleagues think I'm off the planet or I'm just, you know, if I'm raising something and they think it's extreme, you've just gone off, you know, off the edge. There are times when it is not appropriate to raise certain things because there's time and place for everything. But courage is the thing that I find I need to have the most to be able to raise issues that I'm not going to be popular with the executive team. There are actually ways you can overcome that. So a lot of the times what I do, if I feel like I'm going to raise something that's contentious or difficult, you know, there are a few things I can say before I launch into, you know, when I'm asking like, hey, I'm going to wear a really black hat here, but I just want to test. And I turn a lot of things into questions because what I find is that the leadership team that's sitting in the room actually need you not to give them the answer. They need to go on the journey of the thinking that's required to get to the nub of the issue. And there are times where you just think, well, should I raise that? Should I raise it? And, you know, later on you think, I should have raised it <laughs> and I didn't. And I think there's also an evolution around stakeholder expectations of organizations and I think COVID has absolutely accelerated that so if we as you know directors on the board are not aware of how society is changing and and the whole shift from the primacy of the shareholder to stakeholder and the fact that as organizations there are a lot many other stakeholders we need to look after in an organization than just the shareholder then you find that we make decisions that are poor and where we are judged by our customers and our future customers because they're really important to us as having made a very poor decision. Ming, you've probably heard this quote before, shareholder supremacy at all cost is the definition of an organisation as a psychopath. Does that resonate with you? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. And you see that a lot, I think, you know, just to be fair, that's the MBA I did. That's what I was taught at business school when when I did all my degrees. It was the primacy of you do that and then you are seen as successful. And unfortunately in society, we also attribute 
success to people who are extraordinarily wealthy. So, you know, how we measure success is actually a problem within society and that we migrate all of that sort of thinking into our organisations. So I do find that people who are extremely motivated by money, they're willing to sacrifice everything for it. We are all capable of doing really terrible things. If that motivation is there, there's degrees of what you'll sacrifice to be able to get it to be seen as successful. You know, I have a saying that money has no values. The values that money brings come from the individuals that use that money as part of their transfer of power or exerting influence with the money that they have. So, you know, unfortunately, there are people who are very wealthy and have that power and success. They're very capable of doing very good things as well as absolutely terrible things. We who sit on boards, you know, have got there because, as I said before, we can retire tomorrow. We don't actually have to have those jobs. And that's how we spend our money, not just as directors, but also spend the money of the organisation. That's how we translate value and values to our customers and future customers. What is it, do you think, that stops some of those organisations becoming psychopaths? Hopefully individuals and people, you know, hopefully people on boards that bring their values, the integrity, the North Star. I always look for the what is it that's going to motivate you to do the right thing. I find that, you know, if a board is values aligned, it is much easier to have the difficult discussions if it is not you're still stuck trying to get to first base to even talk about things that are hard. If you have a values aligned board, that is much easier. And I think for boards as well, who we hire now into executive teams is even more important. It's no longer the person who meets budget and keeps on meeting budget, which (laughs) it seems to be in the past, the first criteria you must tick before you get promoted you know, I would say that should be the last thing. There are so many other things that are more important in terms of who we should have in leadership than meeting budget. And what role do you think the changing faces around the board table and the changing faces around executive teams that are, I think, perhaps probably slowly becoming more reflective of our society, what impact has that had? Yeah, you know, I find that it makes the discussion richer and we lose so many blind spots. And it was interesting recently, I mean, this is not an example from a board, there was a, there's a group that I've met with recently and we were actually quite diverse, but you still found within that group, there are biases that were so evident to some of us. And I got together with a minority of them and we all laughed at the biases that were so obvious to us, but wasn't obvious to others. And so when you have a diverse board and people are allowed to bring the wealth of the lived experiences that they have and to lay it on the table for discussion and it is valued equally with everybody else's experiences, then you really are able to avoid some of the landmines in decision making that, you know, maybe in the past we would have just completely ignored. And that's where you know, the discussion around the importance of customers and future customers, because you think about future customers and the face of future customers is completely changing and how they're spending their money is completely changing. We need to have that insight on a board to make an organisation successful. So diversity on a board is actually one of the greatest strengths I think you can have in an organisation, not just on the board, obviously throughout the organisation, through the leadership team and every single level. And what I've said in the past is that diversity is hard because it takes longer to get to a decision, but it's probably the most dangerous thing for an organisation to be without. Returning to corporate accountability, we spoke with Rod Sims earlier in the series, obviously the chair of the ACCC, and Rod said that it's important for corporations to be held accountable. And the ACCC's position is that even when an individual in a company commits an offence or a crime that the board would never have tolerated had they knew about it, the ACCC thinks it's critical that the company's held to account. Do you think that's fair? I do. The reason being is that, 
You know, an organisation is not an individual. It's teams and teams of people. We don't really have people that work completely in isolation. And culture matters a lot to whether an individual feels like they can do certain things or not. Now, you know, there will be instances where individuals or a number of individuals even collude to do the wrong thing. But I'd like to think that as an organisation, we can exert a level of, it's almost like peer pressure on each of us to all strive to that North Star. There are certain fundamentals in business, integrity, transparency of some of our decisions, not everything, obviously, some are commercial and confidence, but, you know, for some of our decisions, you know, it's quite important that we together should be able to get to a better outcome. I mean, I do think that where, you know, there has been an individual that is the bad apple, et cetera, that, you know, that individual must be held into account, that unfortunately in the past you've held organisations to account but not individuals, and we've had many examples of that. Individuals must be held into account so that as individuals, we don't feel like we can perpetuate that behaviour or get away with that behaviour. But then as an organisation, we also need to learn to ensure that doesn't happen again. Boards ultimately serve at the pleasure of their shareholders. These shareholders are often large superannuation funds investing billions on behalf of everyday Australians who have saved that money to support them in their retirement. So it's a solemn duty for board members and one where shareholders are holding them directly accountable for bad behaviour. But share markets themselves are also vulnerable to manipulation. What happens when corporate insiders and external organised groups deploy deception in the share market? In the next episode, we'll explore what happens when manipulation hits the market with one of Australia's preeminent class action lawyers, global head of class actions for Herbert Smith Freehills, Jason Betts. I think it is easy to think of this as a corporate concept, but where you have any sort of market manipulation or deception, it is going to have eventually, if not controlled, an economy-wide impact. If you'd like to know more about how KPMG works with organisations to prevent deception and restore trust, head over to our website, which you can find by searching KPMG Forensic. I'm Dean Mitchell, and this is KPMG's Forensic Lens, and I'll see you next time.